If you drive in South Africa from Johannesburg north toward Pretoria, a distance of only 30 miles or so, as you approach Pretoria, your eye will be caught by a vivid stone structure built on the top of a prominent hill. You have reached the Four Trekker Monument. The Four Trekker Monument is a commemoration in honor of the four trekkers who were Afrikaners, Boers, Dutch descended, white South African settlers, who led the way in the European expansion into the far interior regions of what we now call South Africa. To an American, what is most striking about the Four Trekker Monument is the stone wall built around the main building built in a circle, indeed of stone, but with raised relief, with friezes, taken as a whole, the outer wall represents a version in stone of the circling of covered wagons. In the Afrikaans language, this is called the lager, and indeed does refer literally to the wagon circle. In both the United States and in South Africa, this is an image from the frontier which has had the meaning of, of celebrating the, the courage, the heroism of those who went into, penetrated hostile territory and survived by defending themselves in tightly drawn up wagon circles concentrating their firepower on far more numerous opponents. That image of the lager actually carries weight and is a useful one, resonates down through South African history long after the frontier has been closed. So in South Africa, as in America, the frontier has a long history, about two and a half centuries altogether in, in both places shot through with controversies and contending mythologies. In both countries, European settlers gradually spread over vast distances confronting indigenous peoples. And again, as the lager shows, many of the, the same images, sometimes eerily similar images, emerge from the frontier history of, of both places. But in the end, there emerged a huge difference, and I would put it this way. It's a demographic dis uh, difference. Although Europeans, that is whites, ultimately prevailed in both cases, in the United States, Native Americans, American Indians, at the end of the day, comprised only a tiny percentage of the total population. That was not remotely the case in South Africa, where indigenous Bantu peoples were and remain a large majority. Of course, South Africa's frontier history, in one sense, had begun in 1652 with the construction of the first Dutch fort at Cape Town, and we surveyed that in Lecture 15. But it's in the 19th century that the frontier, or perhaps I should say frontiers, as we'll see in a minute, there are multiple, that the frontier process takes on a, a quantum leap in intensities. One way to sense this is to see that both sides of this approaching collision, uh, in a sense, add muscle. The frontier, after all, was heading towards the eastern half of what is today South Africa, and therefore towards the, the areas dominated for many centuries by Bantu-speaking, Iron Age mixed agriculturalists, who for some centuries had lived in much denser populations, far more subtle than the Khoisan hunter-gatherer or pastoralist peoples uh, of the West who had been the first to be on the receiving end of the frontier process. And beyond that, as we saw in the last lecture, this southern Bantu world had gone through on the eve, and even as the frontier is, is, is approaching, gone through a revolutionary transformation of its own. And we saw last time the consolidation of political power in places like the Zulu Kingdom, and indeed the intensification of, of military power in the, the armies of southern Bantu states. So 
To return to the European side of this approaching collision then, the Cape Colony uh, itself, which had served as the uh, principal beachhead, again in, in lecture 15 we talked about how what was immediately or originally intended to be simply an outpost on the edge of the sea, on the edge of the African continent, turned into a beachhead from which this frontier expansion would gradually take place. The Cape Colony, as we know, after 1800 or so, after the first decade in the 19th century, is no longer a Dutch colony. It is a British colony. It's a British possession. Now, this affects the frontier story that we're concerned with today in two principal ways. The first is simply that a second stream, a second arm, if you like, of frontier expansion has now been added to that of the original Dutch and the original Dutch-descended settlers. Britain, after all, at this period is emerging as the most powerful country in, in the world. So the weight of the British Empire is now behind Cape colonial expansion. And there's increasing British settlement as well. After 1820, with the first British settlement at uh, Albany, more and more uh, British settlers are added to the Afrikaner Dutch-descended settlers already on the ground. And in fact, a second beachhead is added in 1843 with the creation of another British colonial possession further east in the Indian Ocean or on the Indian Ocean coast, uh, the colony of Natal. Now, the second way that the British takeover of the, the Old Cape Colony affects the frontier process is essentially this. Britain imposed a far more effective administration in the most basic form of state administration, taxation, for instance, the uh, authority of courts. And this was frankly resented by a number of Afrikaners, particularly those in the, the outer districts who, after all, and this has always been part of the, the Afrikaner national character in their own uh, uh, minds, uh, they had enjoyed a considerable degree of independence and this was impinged upon not simply by a more effective state, but by what they saw as an alien state. It's important to realize that Afrikaners came to feel uh, oppressed by a foreign power, in this case Britain, an alien power, speaking a different language, and so on. They also perceived that British rule meant interference in the established racial order forged in the Cape over a couple of centuries or, uh, or so. This is symbolized perhaps above all in the 1830s when all over the British Empire chattel slavery is abolished and that means it's abolished in uh, the Cape Colony as well. So the emancipation of these formerly enslaved persons again is seen as one more burr under the saddle for Afrikaners, another result of this meddling by this external alien ruler. The result was a sort of rebellion by exit. And indeed, it was the exodus of several thousand Afrikaners out of the Cape Colony and towards the far interior of South Africa, which came to be called the, the Great Trek. This happened in the 1830s and 1840s, and it was those participants in the Great Trek, the four trekkers, simply mean those who went ahead, the four trekkers who were commemorated at the monument that I mentioned at the outset. Now, let's step back for a second, and I'm going to suggest a sort of re-theorization of the whole notion of frontiers. We're used to thinking, at least I've been used to thinking, of frontiers as frontier lines. That is, the movement of a line, a border, essentially, uh, across a space over time. I'm going to suggest that a more useful concept to get at the, the feel for frontiers as they are actually unfolding might be represented by the concept of a frontier zone as opposed to a frontier line. A frontier zone, or to put it differently, zone after zone being uh, created in the South African experience as it did in the United States or other frontier societies, and with two chronological phases, the opening of the frontier zone and the open phase, and then the closing of it after time, the open phase begins with the beginning of sustained contact between two or more sides. That's a bit of a judgment call, what is sustained contact, but nonetheless, begins with sustained contact. The closing of a frontier zone uh, 
comes when one side or the other establishes hegemony, establishes ultimate power over that space, over the, the zone in question. Now, during the open phase, a frontier zone actually has a lot more going on than simply military conflict or, or frontier uh, warfare. Um, just to mention a few of the other kinds of things that are going on in the open frontier phase, there's certainly economic relations between two, and again, sometimes more than two sides here. This was certainly the case in the North American frontier, where the whole history, for instance, of the, the fur trade uh, is an enormous part of the, the frontier history of, of the United States, Canada, and, and so on. Just to illustrate this in one quick example, with one quick example, the Xhosa peoples, Mandela's ancestors, I should say something like Xhosa, right? It's one of those borrowed click sounds. The first of the southern Bantu peoples to experience the encroachment from their west, from the Cape Colony, the trade in cattle pelts, a very basic commodity, coming out of the Xhosa controlled countries, uh, countryside and into the Cape Colony between 1822 and 1827, multiplied 12 hundred percent, a twelve-fold increase in an economic relationship forged in these open frontier zones. It's the beginnings here as well of, of what will become a major theme when we get to the next lecture, and that is Africans who become the employees. It's a labor history that's unfolding in these, or beginning at least, in these open frontier zones. There are cultural interchanges going on in open frontier zones. We think perhaps most obviously of the beginnings of Christian missionary enterprise being carried out in a situation prior to and before political control on the part of, of European powers has been, has been established. During this open phase, I would suggest that there's a lot of people on all sides who are experiencing feelings that we might uh, use words like ambiguity, ambivalence uncertainty. And one of our old favorites, of course, a modern favorite, and let's call it stress, you know? Precisely because it's not clear who's in charge. Who is it that you really need to obey? Who is it that you better make an alliance with or perhaps uh, submit some sort of, of gift or tribute to if you want to survive, if you want to, to make it in a situation marked by this ambiguity and, and uncertainty. We find these surprising alliances which sometimes forge uh, between uh, factors, between leaders. We'll find in the Eastern Cape frontier that some British colonial governors are perfectly happy to ally with with Xhosa chiefs against whom they consider unruly Afrikaners. We'll find that so-called colored populations, which we looked at in, in lecture 15, uh, will uh, very often serve as a sort of swing, swing factor in various kinds of shifting alliances and, as I say, strange bedfellows here. The stress of frontier encroachment is perhaps seen most dramatically in an episode which uh, on first glance seems to be indeed uh, nothing short of bizarre. And I'm referring to the 1857 cattle killing episode in the Kosa speaking peoples uh, to the east of the Cape Colony. A 12-year-old girl, Nankawusa, began to have visions and people began to listen to her and transmit these visions into the countryside. Not all believed by any means, but enough did that they wound up following the prescription which she said had been given to her by spirits. And this prescription called for people to put away wickedness, you know, to put away witchcraft, and perhaps most importantly of all, to make an ultimate sacrifice. In this case, the slaughter of their cattle, all their cattle. And that this would bring forth a millenarian uh, reversal of the world. In essence, uh, the, the final moment, you know, when the kingdom of heaven, if you like, is visited upon earth. As Jeff Paris puts it in his, his wonderful book, The Dead Will Arise, that's precisely what would happen. And the, the ancestors would emerge to help drive the, the white encroachments, the, the white invaders into the sea. That did not happen, as, as you know. And instead, what uh, emerged was something of a human tragedy with a uh, tremendous uh, loss of life due to starvation and due to this, again, millenarian response uh, to frontier stress and frontier pressure. So, 
In the 19th century then, zone after zone is, is opened. A frontier zone after zone is, is opened in various parts, various theaters, if you like, of the frontier process right through what we call South Africa today. And this involved then not just Mandela's uh, people, the Kosa, with his various sections, but eventually it would involve the Tswana and the Sutu and the Vinda and ultimately the Zulu, as we'll see in a couple of minutes. Now, eventually all of these zones then were closed. Hegemony was established either by, your, either by British or by Afrikaner power. In the Afrikaner case, this resulted, the success, if you like, of the Great Trek resulted in two independent Afrikaner states, republics, established in the far interior of what is now South Africa. They were the Transvaal, or the South African Republic, which is the area that now surrounds modern-day Johannesburg, and smack in the middle, the Orange Free State. Again, these were independent republics established in the interior of Southern Africa by Afrikaners after their departure, their exit from the British-controlled Cape. So there's a time there in the mid to late uh, 1800s, 19th century, when what we see in South Africa now is really quite a political checkerboard. I mean, we've after all got still a number of remaining African kingdoms, which are quite independent. The Zulu is only one of, of a number of still independent so sovereign African uh, political communities. We've got two British colonies. We've got the Cape Colony and Natal, and we've got two Afrikaner republics. It really is quite a political hodgepodge or checkerboard for a while. Now, for an excellent example of an African statesman living through the pressures of the, the open and the closing frontier, we can look to Mashweshwe, founder of the modern kingdom of Lesotho. It looks like Lesotho. Lesotho, as you may have noticed, this geographical curiosity of a country completely surrounded on all sides by another country. Lesotho lies in the middle of what on all sides is the modern-day Republic of South Africa. Now, Mashweshwe was born in the same year as Shaka Zulu, whom we looked at in the last lecture, about 1787. But of course, he was born several hundred mi miles uh, away, across the Drakensberg Mountains, and up in the high interior plateau country of, of, of Southern Africa. He can be compared with Shaka on a number of counts. After all, both of them were founders of major kingdoms and so on. But they had a number of contrasts as well. Both were the sons of chiefs, but Mashweshwe was certainly never rejected by his father as Shaka had been. He, by his own accounts, was raised in the warm embrace of a, of a supportive family and so on. Uh, Shaka had a very different personality uh, compared to Mashweshwe. Mashweshwe had a very different one compared to, uh, to Shaka. Mashweshwe certainly showed military skill at a number of points in his lifetime, but his preference always was, was a diplomatic route. After all, he came into his adulthood and into his first parts of his career responding to the threats of insecurity issuing from that Imfakani process, that period of disruption that we looked at in our last um, uh, uh, lecture. And he sought to create alliances, a network of linkages with himself at the center, between various prominent peoples and families all through the region. Again, even his married life is quite different from Shaka. Shaka, as far as we know, never married, never had recognized uh, uh, children. Uh, Mashweshwe enjoyed a, a long, something over 50 years, marriage with his principal uh, first wife, but he took advantage of the institution of polygyny to take wives, the daughters of prominent men, prominent families throughout the region, and therefore created a sort of web of kinship with himself uh, at, the, at the center. Perhaps the biggest difference between Shaka and Mashweshwe was the fact that Mashweshwe lived twice as long. Shaka, as we know, was assassinated in 1828. Mashweshwe lived until 1870, uh, into his early 80s. This meant that unlike Shaka, Mashweshwe lived long enough to face not only the, the periods of, uh, of disruption represented by the Infokani, but to face up front and close the onslaught or the encroachment of the European frontier. Shaka never had uh, to, to, to deal with that. 
I mentioned that Mashweshwe utilized not only diplomacy, but his own military leadership, and he innovated militarily in at least two ways. One was the adoption of horses, and if you go to Lesotho today, you will see many, many people on horseback. This, in a sense, is another legacy of Mashweshwe's left uh, behind. The other, as you might have guessed, is to use all manner of contacts, including contraband contacts, to obtain guns. Eventually, Mashweshwe would fight four major engagements, wars, with either Afrikaner or British power. By the end of his life, however, with his domain at this point sort of whittled down, kind of uh, a nibbling away at the edges, his domain, his kingdom, the extent of it, reduced to about half of what it was by the time he gets into uh, the 1860s compared to what it was at its peak. Mashweshwe at this point could see which way the wind was blowing in later 19th century southern Africa. Choosing what he saw as the lesser of two evils, he agreed to a treaty creating a so-called British protectorate over Lesotho. Protectorate is one of those words which it merges, becomes important in, in colonial Africa later and represents um, one form of, of colony. In other words, Mushweshwe had lost his ultimate sovereignty when he agreed to this protectorate in 1868. Um, and this special relationship forged with the British crown, by the way, is what explains the, the geographical curiosity I mentioned a moment ago about about a country surrounded by another. My students tell me that uh, on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire a couple of years ago, they ask a question about this. Which country is it surrounded by another? Um, the guy got it right. You never know what sort of benefits might flow from, from attending a course like this. Now, how did Mushweshwe and Lesotho fare in this bitter pill that he swallowed, in this bargain? of 1868. Mashweshwe's successors certainly retained a greater measure of day-to-day -day power, and, and indeed one of his distant uh, descendants is on the throne there today. Day-to-day uh, uh, -day power than many other uh, leaders who were uh, disturbed, defeated, uh, or in some cases deposed in, in the region. It avoided, the country avoided the worst impositions of 20th century segregation and apartheid. Its school system, for instance, was not emasculated in the name of apartheid like South Africa's was. And Lesotho, by the middle of the 20th century, enjoyed astoundingly high literacy rates of, of something over 80%. Economically, on the other hand, the Lesotho people largely met the same fate as other peoples in South and indeed in all of Southern Africa. And that is, they led lives dominated by the reality of labor migration. To that we turn in, in the next lecture. Now, as everyone very likely knew, the premier obstacle to the completion of white conquest in South Africa was the continued independence of the Zulu kingdom. By the time of the 1870s, the Zulu kingdom is being ruled by Chachwayo. He is the third Zulu king after Shaka. He took the throne in 1872, and he found himself uh, confronting this uh, ever-encroaching European, multi-sided European frontier. In his case, he was threatened by Afrikaner power to his north and by British power to his south in the colony of, of Natal. Rather like Mashweshwe, but not, as it turned out, nearly so successfully, he formed an alliance for a time with the British colony of Natal. In 1878, that alliance uh, was severed when Theophilus Shepstone, Natal's Secretary of Native Affairs, essentially turned on, on Chechwayo and ultimately uh, issued an ultimatum uh, calling for total Zulu disarmament within 30 days. Now, a Zulu king with the centrality of the army to that kingdom, the symbolic centrality to it, uh, clearly could not accede to an ultimatum of this sort, and in fact, uh, Chechwayo did precisely the opposite. He mobilized his army. The British invaded Zululand in January of 1879. By the end of that month in early February, they had suffered some catastrophic defeats at a place called Isandwana, perhaps the greatest defeat of a British army in all of the 19th century, certainly the greatest since the, the charge of the Light Brigade in the Crimea in 1856. A week later, uh, another major battle at Rourke's Drift, which ended in something of a, of a standoff. But the tide was eventually turned within a few months by the latest weaponry, uh, 
And on July the 4th, 1879, the Zulu capital at Ulundi was sacked. It was this 1879 campaign and the admiration which even the, the British officers and, and soldiers developed for the astonishing courage of Zulu soldiers which catapulted the word Zulu into the, the Western lexicon. Rudyard Kipling, no less, wrote a, a poem uh, in, in respect, uh, with respect to Zulu soldiers praising them for breaking a British square, the, the old British infantry formation. By the 1890s then, with the power of the African states finally broken, the British and the Afrikaners turned on each other. It's important to mention right now that the stakes by this time were infinitely higher as we will see in detail in the next lecture. Diamonds and gold, the discovery of those now meant that overall control in South Africa represented a very considerable prize to whomever could, could establish it. There followed then a, a war, actually a very vicious war, between 1899 and 1902, about, about two and a half years, Britain, in order to subdue the Afrikaner republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, had to dispatch overseas the, the largest expeditionary force ever seen uh, up to that point in, in world history, something like 250,000 British soldiers joining the British forces uh, on the ground, represented by the older British settlers and colonial forces. Uh, in the effort to, to conquer the Afrikaner uh, republics. This war witnessed, uh, among other things, the invention of the, the, the concentration camp. And it was uh, an invention which uh, is generally laid to the, to the British side uh, of this. Nonetheless, the ultimate victor here, as in the case of the American Civil War, which bears a considerable amount of, of similarity on, in some respects, the ultimate victory went to the more industrialized uh, nation, the nation which could put more troops in the field, which could draw on uh, the latest in the products of uh, the technology, technology of, the, of the industrial age. And that certainly was uh, Britain at this point. Like the Zulu War, which has been the, the subject of at least two major feature movies, Michael Caine in, in Zulu and Burt uh, Lancaster in, in Zulu Dawn, about those two battles that I, I mentioned um, a moment ago. So the South African War, or the Boer War, has been much the stuff of popular legend for, for a long time. The songs like, We Are Marching to Pretoria, uh, and, and so on. As in the aftermath of the American Civil War, there emerged a period of what is called in both places, Reconstruction. And after a period of a bit less than a decade, about eight years, of on-again, off-again negotiations between the, the victorious British side, but the very uh, stubbornly assertive Afrikaner side, both during uh, and, and after the the Boer War, a new constitution was finally forged and the way was clear for the emergence of a new country. In 1910, then, the Union of South Africa is born. It comes into existence as a part of the British Empire, but essentially one, they didn't use the term dominion uh, yet, that would come a couple of decades later, but essentially a part of the British Empire, yes, but a settler-governed part of the British Empire. In that constitution, for instance, it was specified that only whites could serve in the South African Parliament. And that remained the case uh, for a very long time indeed, until the, the 1980s. With 1910, we see then the country we today call South Africa we will return to its history as we look at its uh, emergence as a home of segregation and later apartheid in the 20th century. Thank you.